Ok. <coughs> Two points. Um, ok. Is everyone fine with uh, the ITPP is recording uh, the talks and uh, uses to put it online? Is everything fine with it or do some problem? Uh, if anyone has some uh, problem with it, uh, let me know. Uh, and uh, on me, you have to check on the microphone is recorded. So uh, the speaker should speak on this microphone and when there is a question, uh, please wait that I uh, bring the microphone uh, so you use it to ask your question so that it's properly recorded. Okay? Good? This, the team is yours. So, can you hear me? Ooh, sounds nice. <laughs> okay, so good morning, everybody. My name is Pablo, that's Gustavo, Gustavo, and Henrique. And the paper <laughs> that we decided to present for you today is this one entitled, uh, what is it? Here. Coherent Backscatter of Light by Disorder Media, Analysis of Peak Line, of the Peak Shape Line. The paper is from Ackermans, Wolf, and Maynard. So, the paper talks about a very, let's say, general and broad problem, which is the wave scattering disorder in medium. So this problem is general because it happens in very in different areas. We can have the light scattering by living tissues, the light is scattered by a fog atmosphere, we can have metal wave scattering in a disordered potential, we can also talk about the scattering of electronic systems in metals and so on. S being more specifically, the idea is that uh, Usually, when you have some some special conditions, which is like the mean free path is smaller than the average particle distance, you can treat these scattered systems using a diffusive wave approximation, which is work nice. For those who don't know, the idea is that uh, you are going to just consider the correlations that can be between different scatterings, and you completely vanish out possible possible phases correlations. So this works well, except for the problem that is investigated in the paper, which is the backscattering of light. So the idea is that when you have the backscattering of light, basically you are going to shine light or other waves in a system. When you have the backscatter, which is the scattering in the backward direction, you there are two important problems that were studied in the 80s, there which are the weak localization of electronic system and the coherent backscattering of light. The paper itself focuses on coherent backscatter of light. And the idea is that so if I collect the light that is scattered by a, by a sample of random distributions, I'm going to have this speckle pattern. But when I average over the, the position of these, of these scatters, I, I recover some co coherence effects with this back, backscatter of light, which is basically a peak of light in the backscatter direction. So these were studying different systems. And the basically the paper what it does is the deduces a formula to treat these problems. So now it's gonna be other Gustavo. All right, thank you. So which is the button I have to pr press here? Yeah, oh, okay. So guys, uh, the idea when you're uh, building your model here is the how to represent your material and your the light coming in. So the idea is we're gonna do it all, uh, the paper does it all classically in a certain way. The idea is when a light comes in, uh, mostly usually plana, it, it can scatter multiple times and come back the other way. Ideally, uh, if you reverse the, the path, these waves should interfere uh, constructively. So this is this can be the light coming in, but it could come in the other way around. You see, for this interference to occur uh, coherently, you should expect that the your incoming wave should be approximately minus the outcoming wave. So here it, this is the wave coming in, and this is the wave coming uh, out from the reverse sequence. Okay, and the angle should be given uh, by this. So let's discuss this angle a, a, bit, a little bit more. Uh, here, are s I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name some terms that are going to appear on a huge integrals just so you don't get lost, OK? So this distance here is the distance between the first and the last scatter, and Q is the sum of the waves. You see that if, if one wave is exactly the opposite of the other one, this should be close to 0, OK? And this uh, cosine should go to 0. This effect usually happens when uh, 
this theta here is around uh, smaller than in the smaller than uh, the wavelength divided by the mean path. The mean path is the mean distance between scatterers. So this is the huge integral I was talking about. Uh, I have represented here by color. It's color coded, okay? So and and uh, so nobody gets lost. And uh, the idea here is. Uh, Okay, so we were we're showing on on top of the definition, but the definition is the flux. The albedo should be the flux uh, coming out of this uh, plane uh, over in a solid angle this way. So here on yellow is the energy density. And here is the probability of this density being scattered the other way, and green is the incident flux. This here is the last slide. Okay, just so you remember, if this is zero. This should be around two. This is this would be our uh, expression corresponding to this uh, doubling of the uh, intensity of the spectrum. Okay, and here you have this Q over here. This Q over here, I won't go into many details, so I'm just going to skip it really fast. You can. This is basically a kernel or a green function measuring how. Uh, you're interacting each scatter with the, the other one when you're counting in this scatter. And can be solved with green function uh, method. Uh, this green function should obey a diffusion equation as Pablo showed earlier. And this is maybe our boundary condition. Uh, you can see on this uh, citation here that uh, this Z0 should be around this, which is a bit little bit outside of this plane. Gustavo? So you can do some approximations to better understand this uh, scattering function. One of them is considering R and R prime located at the same plane, Z is equal to L, and considering a uh, quasi-normal incidence, we will consider me and me zero equal, equal to one. When you do that, you we can have this uh, simplified equation, and if we do this uh, integral, we'll get this result. This equation uh, shows us at least three things. Uh, first, when it's close to the back backscattering direction, I mean when theta is close to zero, uh, it becomes linear, it's almost a triangle function. The angle with in which the coerced effect is in the order of lambda to divided to two pi L. And I think the most important is when theta is equal to zero, which means exactly in the direction of this the, the backscattering, uh, the albedo is exactly twice the incoherent value of theta obtained for large angles. And if we do not this approximation, uh, we get this expression when we solve that uh, integral. And this expression is really uh, got a shape that is close to the we obtain uh, experimentally. OK, so uh, first we have this, uh, this expression here that is very important for our model. And here, so we have the the this basically panel here that shows the scattering intensity per by angle in degrees. So here in this set, uh, we have the, the representation of the equation in the last slide. And so we have the uh, the, the lambda like abs uh, equals like 0.5 uh, micrometers and L, and that's like uh, like the transport mean path for anisotropic scattering. Okay. So here, uh, as important thing that we need to notice is this this shape of this curve that's like that they have this peak here centered in the angle equals zero, okay? So uh, this is basically the case of scalar waves that the authors use in the first part of the article. But uh, you know that there is a, a different behavior from the experiment analysis and once you have the, the, the different curves, we need to, to basically construct another type of model and here, uh, the authors show us uh, basically this coherence radio, and the, the equation above can be used to when the polar rise is parallel to the incident one, and to cement the enhancement factor for cross polarization, okay, by summing over the n scalar and scattering contribution. So, the the basically is we have this enhancement here, and the, the angular width is very different from the article results compared from the experiment results here. So the full line is the theoretical with the, the second method used. And we have this like a very good uh, fit 
from the theoretical and experimental uh, curves, okay? The experimental curve started from this article, and so we, we for conclusion, we have the authors analyze the experimental line shape of the albedos within the diff diffusion approximation and explain the observed effect effects of polarization. And although it's a relative old paper, it's still to have a major influence in the area to a uh, coherent backstack backscattering nowadays, like this uh, very recently paper and uh, like you know, published in the Nature Physics. And for further details and concepts treated in this paper, we really recommend see the book of Arkman's Mesoscope Physics of Electrons and Photos. So that's it. Thank you. What is the point of doing it with uh, cold atoms rather than uh, a glass of milk or uh, any material that is disordered? Uh, I don't think that is so important the what you use it to do the measurement because the most interesting part is especially the generality of the problem, right? You can see this with cold atoms, with milk, with paper, with any multiple scatter systems. But in the article, they use a, a solution of uh, water and plastic spheres, something like this. Thank you. Could you could you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Today we are going to try to explain a little bit about the paper related with the quantum phase transition between a superfluid to a moda insulator regime. Uh, in order to do that, we are going to try to discuss an article published in Nature and that is titled Quantum Phase Transition from a Superfluid to a Moda Insulator in a Gas of Ultra-Cold Atoms. In particular, these ultra-cold atoms are going to be bosonic particles. So let's try, uh, let's begin by saying that when we have uh, counter-propagating las lasers, we can have optical lattices in which we can position uh, different kind of particles. Uh, particles as, uh, as bosonic ones or fermionic ones. Uh, in this specific paper, uh, they use uh, bosonic particles by using alkali atoms, in particular the one that is uh, an isotope of rubidium. So we are going to start by assuming that we have uh, bosonic particles and we are, uh, we are going to cool the system uh, until they reach a temperature of zero Kelvin or approximately near, uh, in this case, and in a scale of nano Kelvins, and we are going to have a Bose-Einstein condensate. Then we are going to turn on the optical lattice and we are going to have uh, interaction in each one of the sites and also tunneling between neighboring sites. That is, we are going to be in the uh, superfluid regime. So one good model to start by describing this kind of phenomena is using uh, the bose Hubbard hamiltonian This one is known usually as the spinless bose Hubbard one. 
uh, this kind of Hamiltonian is composed by three main terms. The first term is the hoping term, which is going to tell me what is happening between the tunneling between neighboring sites. And this parameter right here that is J or T in some of the literature is just known as the amplitude of half tunneling between neighboring sites. The second term is the interaction term that is telling me about what is happening in each side of our lattice. And our last term is just the chemical potential that we introduce in order to minimize the energy. Also, chemical potential is going to tell me how much energy is required to introduce or uh, quite a particle. Also, when we cool the system, uh, we are going to have that the, um, at low temperatures, we start to develop uh, quantum phase property and uh, quantum properties, and in particular, uh, quantum phase transitions. If you see when the hoping parameter is dominate, dominating over the um, uh, interaction parameter, we are going to have the superfluid phase in which particles are tunneling between neighboring sides without stop, because the energy doesn't need to pay a lot of energy to can have this uh, phenomenon. And when the interaction is winning over the hoping parameter, our particles are, being, are going to be well localized in each side of our lattice. And as a consequence of her have a chemical potential, uh, we are going to have a constant number of, of bos uh, or bosonic particles in each side of our lattice. So here we can see uh, the wave functions or the ket related to the wave functions, but in this case in two dimensions in which we can see the superfluid phase in which we have uh, the localization of the wave function and also we, can we have the, uh, another point of view that is the mode isolator regime in which our particles are well localized in each side of our lattice. Okay. And here, with the phase diagram of both the Hubbard model in, sorry, here, and in this first image with the mod slope in gray for one density, two density, and three density, this plot is over the chemical, reduced chemical potential in function of T or J parameter of the first Hub Hamiltonian of Buzz Hubbard model, and this plot was made using this previous equation for T or J parameter, and uh, in other plot with the numerical simulation of uh, this phase diagram. All right, thank you. Um, um, here is the respect ex experiment of the uh, techniques. I'm not, I'm not going to enter in details because of the time, but. Um, uh, as Alejandro said, the you can use Ruby. The, the 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 guys use Ruby to make the condensate Rubidium to make the Bose-Einstein condensate, and the method of first the rate of frequency evaporation to get the bo in the Bose-Einstein state or to cool down the atoms. And uh, the the optical lattice was made by three uh, parallel stand waves, where you get. Uh, when the, the 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 crossing point is in the center of the bose einstein condensate, and uh, the the sum of the the different stand waves gives a cubic type geometry of the lattice that is given by this equation. This v v zero here is the depth of the the lattice potential, and uh, usually is is uh, it's it's uh, written in terms of recoil energy in units of recoil energy that is said like that that is. Uh, the expression is written right here, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna use like just CRR uh, in the in the in the presentation. And uh, the main thing here is that the Bose-Einstein condensate is uh, previously in the magnetic trap, and uh, to uh, to pass it for the to the lattice potential, you need to uh, increase the depth of the the. Um, the lattice potential is slowly, gradually. So this is called a slow ramp speed, and this guarantees that the the main body quantum state stays in the in the ground state. Uh, as uh, as Alejandro was saying, like the the superfluid state is in the, and the localized state. This means that it has a long range phase coherence, and uh, mod insulator is uh, this the atoms is localized, so it lost his coherence. So the main thing here is how we like 
see what state uh, the 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 element is in. So the main thing here is the 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 authors is trying to uh, to measure the coherence, and how they don't how they done that. They uh, at first they switch it off the 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 trapping the trapping system and uh, as soon as they switch it off the trapping but the trapping system they start to the wave equations start to interact into them in in and uh, uh, interference patterns so this that interference patterns is what is measured here so if you had a, a coherence state uh, which means that you are in the a uh, superfluid state or f superfluid phase, you have a coherent state or you have a, you have a interference pattern and uh, if you are in the mod insulator system you lost the coherence so you don't have this pattern so here is how you enter in the mod insulator uh, here is they say like um, eight measurements with uh, eight different uh, lattice depths so in the first one you have zero depth you have a, a very nice this first one have a very nice sharp interference pattern, and as soon as as you uh, increase the 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 potential the depth of the lattice, you lost that coherence and you don't have any more an interference pattern. This means that you that you enter in the uh, mod insulator system. Uh, another property of the mod one property of the mod insulator system is that uh, he restoring he can restore his coherence. <laughs> All right, right. Uh, another thing is that he he can like uh, store his coherency very quickly. He like he, he they found that measurement where uh, he, they increase the potential and then uh, reduce it, and uh, you can find here that uh, the coherence is restored. And okay, and the last quantity was measured in this article with the probe in the excitation spectrum. In this first image, with that the excitation gap in the mod insulator for one atom per lattice site, this first image A is the shift U in energy direction, and here in figure B is the same U shift but in Z direction. And to explain these theoretical plots in experimental techniques, was given by this figure. Here is the experimental technique, and this depth potential uh, enclosed the maximum value is Vmax, and at same condition for 20 milliseconds with this restored the superfluid state, and in figure B is the experimental image, and in figure C, D, E, and F is the measurement of experimental values. And in last measure, measure with that the potential depth in function of the variation energy. And this point is important because the dashed line is the theoretical prediction of this, this the measure, and this point is the experimental point. It's very important because in this experiment, with that the experimental point agrees with prediction theoretical. And uh, just to finish, can I pass? Uh, I'm just gonna read the conclusion very quickly. They uh, they find that the the mod insulator the the transition phase is around uh, two to three ERs require energy, and uh, indicates that the transition to the mod insulator phase is in that region. Uh, and the theoretical prediction like matches with the with the guys found uh, that uh, it is it is in the article the calculation and. Um, uh, he said about uh, uh, things that can be used, that the experimental realization of the buzz Hubbard model with an atomic gas now allows to start the strong uh, correlate many body quantum mechanics with unprecedented controls of parameters. Control of parameters. Yeah. That's it, guys, I think. Uh. <laughs> Thank you.
Fast scene, one, two, three, one, two, three. Hey guys, good morning. We are Guru Paul, Grover Andrade, and Guilherme Costa. We are presenting you the article called Very Cold Indeed, the Nano-Kelvin Physics of Bose-Einstein Condensation. Well, this article is about what is a BEC, how to make a BEC, and what do we do with a BEC. So basically, we are going to start with what is a BEC. Uh, at first, if we only concern about the spin property of the particles, we are going to have two kinds of, part of particles, sorry. The fermions and the bosons, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, bosons and fermions, okay? We know that the difference about the, this distribution function is that we can make the, the bosons to be on the ground state all in a all in the same state of energy in difference with the fermion because they can be in the same energy only if the degeneracy of the spin allow it, right? For example, here we have a spin one half and we have a two degeneration so we can have two spins on H energy level. Um, well, when does the quantum nature of our gases becomes to be important, well, we are going to define a uh, thermal wavelength that is called the thermal wavelength of the Grubby, this equation. The only part important here is that it depends on the inverse of the temperature, and we're going to define a distance between the particles, in this case atoms, that is called to the air. So the quantum nature of our gas is going to be very important, or to become important, to have this different distribution when the distance between the atoms becomes approximately the same length that the wavelength, or the wavelength is longer than the this distance. So, if we have this, sorry, if we have this, we can put all the particles on the ground state, and we are going to call this a back. But there are certain details about the chemical potential and other questions in the capa heat capacity. But in fact, we are going to say that we are going to have a back when the wavelengths of the different particles get on this function and become uh, only one wave, right? Only one wave function. And well, we are going to start by saying that we are going to need, uh, well, how do we do a back then? To start, we're going to need a really good boy. To make that, or well, what's the reason for that? It's if we go very low on temperature, the things or the cases becomes to freeze, it condenses on liquid or maybe solid. To avoid that, we're going to make a boy to, to uh, not allow the gas to nucleate around a particle, an external particle, and also we're got we are going to avoid the three body collisions because the three body collisions can be condensed by the reserve. So it starts to condense only with that. And to make that, we are going to need very low density. Okay. Thank you, just to test the other thing. So okay, first of all, we need to get on very high densities and not that high, but and low temperatures. To do that, we need to first cool the atoms. To cool the atoms, we do, we, we do this with a device called quantum molasses, uh, optical molasses, sorry. The optical molasses use a laser to transfer momentum from the light to, a, to the atom. That transfer of momentum will make the, uh, the atom to experience a force. And this force is, uh, is uh, mainly by the Doppler shift. So we keep going this process to start reducing the velocity of the atom. Also, uh, we get to a limit, the limit made by Brownian motion with the, the collisions of the atoms with the, the small pieces of, of air that remains on, on your void because no void is that perfect experimentally. So then we turn off the, the lasers 
uh, and then the, we know the, the authors, but you turn off the lasers and then the atom will start, start to fly by gravity. By the falling with gravity, they are uh, cool enough to be easily trapped by a magnetic field because the rubidium atoms uh, that they're using to try, they're trying to condensate, they have an unparalleled uh, spin momentum due to, due to, due to, due to this, this one electron. So they are kind of easy to trap in this magnetical trap. But still, I said to you that the atom is not cooled enough. They are, they are limited by, by, by Brownian motion. So how can you cool even more, so how, so how you can cool even more the atom? To do that, we use evaporative cooling. Uh, we have intuition by that, that when you, when you lay your clothes to, to dry, your wet clothes to dry, you st uh, it does not reach like 100 Celsius. But rather happens a, a process on which by the thermal distribution of energies, some, some atoms or molecules, they have enough energy to, to break free of the potential bonds, right? By doing that, you start to losing your high energy atoms and the lower energy and you start to reduce the mean energy, therefore reducing the temperature. But okay, this is example is like a fluid, like, I mean, uh, water molecules living uh, as a vapor. But how do you do that as a Bo Bose-Einstein condensate? First, uh, first you have, uh, uh, you raise your frequency, tra uh, your, your razor frequency uh, field that, okay, you have these hot atoms that are leaving your field. This is called top trap. So, First, you can change, uh, this is a parameter that you can change experimentally. So then you your start to change the amplitude of your radio frequency trap, and then the hot atoms start to, to move on your trap. They have enough energy to escape this, this potential. So you doing that slowly, you, vapor, you do evaporative cooling, that you only remain with the colder atoms with the smaller thermal energy. Okay, so uh, is this part? Okay, so in this part, I will discuss some uh, experimental numbers uh, regarding this uh, evaporative cooling. So, in suppose you are a good experimentalist and you get a fantastic Doppler cooling. So, with even with this good Doppler cooling you can achieve a temperature that is called the Doppler limited temperature and it is around some few hundred micro kelvins. And density will be around 10 to the power 10 uh, centimet atoms per centimeter cube, but if you calculate the phase space density that is given by uh, this formula N0 lambda cube, then you will find that the phase space density will be around 10 to the power minus five. But uh, if you uh, work with some uh, statistics, then you will find that to have a Bose-Einstein condensate, you need a phase space density of around, of, oh, sorry, of the order of one. So how do you do that? So one way is to do is, you have to increase the density and the decrease the temperature. If you decrease the temperature, evidently you will end up with a larger de Broglie wavelength. So that's the idea. So when you are not doing any Doppler cooling, if you are in ambient temperature, the phase space density is 10 to the power minus 15. If you do the Doppler cooling, you can have a 10 to the power minus six phase space density. That's not enough. And if you do a further evaporative cooling by, and then you will end up with a phase space density of one. That's the onset of both science and condensate. So as you can see here, it's just a Doppler, uh, <laughs> it's a Doppler cooling. And then uh, if you keep on doing the uh, RF evaporation, then you will, there is a spike uh, that ends up at the middle of the thermal cloud and that's the basically the onset of both science and condensates. So there has been two Nobel Prize for this laser cooling and the evaporative cooling there. So yeah, so what? Okay, just, just two minutes. <laughs> So, okay, so here this is the uh, distribution of the atoms when you have a Doppler cooling. If you keep on doing the evaporation, you will end up with this spike. So this is the bimodal distribution. And you do the evaporative cooling by gradually decreasing the uh, radio frequency amplitude. So as you can see, you can go from this way to that way. At some point, your density will pick up here. 
with some 4.1 megahertz and then it will suddenly decrease. So why it is decreasing? Because at that time you are now reducing, you are now cutting the condensate itself. So that's why the density will decrease there. <coughs> and this is the last slide. So how do you, how do you image the BEC? So it's just a conventional absorption imaging technique where you shine an on and light to the bosons and condensates there and you uh, do some diffraction limited imaging to get the uh, condensate there in the CCD array. So this is how this uh, bimodal distribution looks uh, when you image this. So this is the thermal cloud and this is the uh, this condensate this arriving there and this is simply the thermal cloud that uh, you get after the ballistic expansion when you release the condensate from the trap. So, okay, thank you. Thanks guys, I'm a baby. Hi guys, good morning. We are Clarissa, uh, Daniel, and Claudio. Gustavo. <laughs> um, I don't know speaking English, so I tell him uh, my parents. Como que Okay, historical context. Um, at the time you ran the paper, there is publication. Oh, come <laughs> on. <laughs> uh, a redefinition of squeezy spin techniques, which was independent of the quantum correlation and dependent solely on the Kuhn-Knight system. That definition was inappropriate for practical reason and the therefore in this work was established the basic conception of squeezy spin states and discussion the principles for third generation. The work proposed two me mechanisms <laughs> referred to as one axis to sting and two axis compare two strings to reduce the stage quantum noise as for two mm, of the conhers as spin stage zone and effect <laughs> very in prevention of spin screens in the thermal metal uh, are of this to say So uh, squeezing consists in the redistribution of the quantum fluctuations between two non-commuting observables and uh, preserving the minimum uncertainty principle. So it is important in many uh, fields of science, there is no an exclusive property of uh, fermions, but also from uh, for uh, uh, bosons. And one of the applications that will be uh, uh, explained by the authors in this paper is in interferometers. And the basic concept that uh, will be important to, defi to define the squeezing is a coherent state. At that time, coherent states and squeezing states was already uh, very well defined for uh, bosons. And it in this case, in the case of bosons, it's much simpler. Uh, you can find that a coherent state is just a distribution of, the of all energy agent states and in a specific distribution that is Poissonian. 
And in the case of fermions, you cannot have this kind of spectrum. Uh, so you have to um, put more fermions in the, in the, um, into, the, into the set and to, to work with more fermions. And this kind of definition uh, uh, will give to, we arise to this uh, definition of coherent states. That it is like a Poisson distribution, but in the case of fermions, it's a binomial distribution which measures the redistribution of the populations in the energy agent states of uh, up and down. This is, uh, uh, um, you can consider the coherent states as a basis that is parameterized by the uh, angles, the polar and asymmetrical angles of the block sphere. Um, um, yeah, this. And when you prove this in, in the basis of, of momentum, uh, you have this kind of, uh, of phase of the, of the, uh, of these states. And there are uh, various uh, ways to introduce this kind of states. One of them is this. It, this is not in the paper. This is in the notes of Philippe. But in the paper, they are an equivalent uh, introduction of these coherent states that are related with this operator as the agent states of this operator, which allows for a, a geometric uh, understanding of these states as a cone in the um, associated to the, um, to the mean value of the spin, such that uh, the, the uh, normal components <coughs> to this vector are squeezed. And this, this uh, leads to a, a, a different perspective in the sense that you can, you, can, you can think this as a distribution that, are, that is or not correlated. And you can find also a definition of coherent states as a distribution of spins such that they are not correlated. correlated. And this will, will be uh, uh, presented in a block sphere with this kind of behavior. And then when we have uh, what is a coherent state, we can define what, define what is a spin state. And, and spin state will be um, the same kind of set of uh, fermions, but when they are correlated with a specific correlation. In fact, uh <coughs> this kind of appropriate correlations is what the paper will, will introduce in order to uh, define completely this kind of states. And this is a mathematical part. The paper is focused in um, introduce this kind of mathematics to, to um, get these states. And it, this is done with this kind of uh, evolution operator that is here, which is given by this function of the uh, three components of the spin. And when you do uh, a, uh, a unitary transformation of S plus, you will get this kind of, uh, of result that is depending of this function that if you uh, calculate it is of this, is given by this, by this expression here. And then this kind of expression allows for include nonlinear terms in the, in the, um, in any approximation, but they are, they are taking um, the lower order approximation nonlinear, which includes this, uh, excuse me, which includes, thi includes this term and once you put this, this, this guy here, uh, you find this function, and with this function, you took this time evolution operator, and then you can do this uh, transformation, this unitary transformation, and with this unitary transformation, you will get squeezing. So how it going? You take this, this time evolution operator, now this includes this, uh, this key, which uh, measure the, the uh, how, how, how much nonlinear is this function, and then you can do this unitary transformation and to get these expressions uh, that are used to calculate the, the variance of the uh, component of the spin, of the mean spin, and you will see in the block sphere that uh, disappear as a, as a redistribution of the um, uncertainties such that uh, one is squeezed and the other one is uh, expanded to compense uh, the fact that you are in a minimum certain state. And then this, this graphics shows when you start with a global, with a coherent state, that is this guy, and then you apply this unitary transformation, then you get 
this kind of redistribution of the quadrature, and this is uh, called one axis twisting because you are uh, using this kind of operator that rotates around uh, uh, the Z component. And the other, the other, um, the other way to to um, to get squeezing is to use this kind of operator, which is called a twi a two axis counter twisting operator in the sense that it depends of the uh, square of the S plus and S minus and S minus. And you can see that for, for uh, this graphic, it includes the variance. The, variant, the minimum value of the variance is uh, this one for coherent states, and this for the case of one axis, and this for the case of two axis, showing that this kind of Hamiltonian can reduce the uncertainties better than the other two. And now we will see how this can be implemented uh, uh, experimentally. I think I will not need the microphone, so <laughs> yeah. for her. Okay, okay. So, as stated by Daniel and uh, and Clarice, the authors have demonstrated a new way of visualizing squeezing and provided experimental options for achieving spin squeezing. They offer two possible systems for achieving this: interferometry and two-level atoms. And starting with inter, <laughs> I'm sorry. So starting with interferometry, we can see in Figure A here that the the authors provide a simple system using just a beam splitter. But I I, uh, I think that in article this was very sim simple. So I searched for a uh, more elaborated uh, image to explain better, I think. So they use first a beam splitter to separate the, the, the states from the, the atoms or, or photons and use something to change the relative phase between them, like a optical uh, care median. And then use another beam splitting splitter to uh, make interferometry between them. With two level atoms, they use basically the same system, but now in figure B, we can see it's about just the populations in the two levels of the atoms. And concluding uh, for the case of, oh, sorry. <laughs> concluding, the, the authors clarify the concept of spin squeezing, and to do this, you need quantum correlations among elementary spins, and they uh, spoke about the expectations about the reduction no noise and use to quantum sense and metrology, and propose of some implementations in interferometers. Thanks all for your attention. Uh, okay, so you were talking a little bit about that the spin coherent states could be written as a function of the quasi-momentum, but we also know from the definition that the coherent states could be obtained just by applicating the rotation operator to the uh, state with uh, maximum magnetic projection. Uh, if we know that there are two ways to write the spin coherent states, how can we know uh, what is the most more useful to the situation, for instance, in this case? Yeah, well, uh, I, I think that uh, it is depending on your problem because um, the representation that you will use, uh, it is always depending on the problem that you are trying. But the, the, you, can, you can show that these kind of uh, expressions are equivalent. So, in any sense, when you are working some problem, you can use one or other basis depending on what are you when it when wanted to get. But the, 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 the definitions are equivalent. And maybe, and maybe there will be another, uh, there could be other kind of um, definition uh, related directly with the uncertainty principle. 
that you can mi you can minimize it. And it, in fact, in the paper, they they get a minimization once they obtain the uncertainty. So there are maybe one or two more steps to to get uh, squeezing, and not just uh, with a rotation of the w with one rotation of the coherent state. Hello. Hi, good morning. Uh, we are the group A, and I'm Adriano Barreto, and Alejandra, and Cesar Amaral. And we present to you right now this paper. is a paper that was published in 1986. It's a physical review letter. And some points about the introduction of this paper is that uh, the authors reported in, uh, in this paper uh, experimental demonstration of the shelving that is a, a, that's a, a scheme to, to demonstrate quant jumps. So in this, in this experiment, they used a barium uh, ion laser coolant uh, in radio frequency strap. And um, the, state, uh, the state detection in cooling are performed by two lasers, which provides these transitions between these levels that are strong transitions that provide fluorescence. And also, uh, we have incoherent excitations to this, uh, this metastable uh, energy level that is uh, important to suppress uh, the fluorescence and make more possible to uh, measure or to see more easily um, the, the dark period to, to measure that the atom are in, in the ground state, for example. And it's also important to say that uh, their observation were the first well, uh, known application of this scheme to detect bit optical transitions in individual idols. Um, well, okay, so, uh, few points about the experiment. Uh, it's important to have in this technique uh, that th this technique, sorry, requires an atom with two excited states. Uh, both uh, are uh, radically uh, coupled to the same ground state. But the key point here is that we have um, di uh, drastically different times uh, lifetime is between uh, where the, the atom is in an in a, uh, excited level. So, for example, uh, we, we need to, this metastable uh, energy level that have a, a, a lifetime longer than ter uh, 30 seconds to identify the dark period in the fluorescence because where the atom, the ion is, is, is in this level, we have, uh, how can I say that? The, the fluorescence is suppressed by where the atom is in this level. Also, it is important to say that in order to suppress collision or the activation of this metastable uh, level, uh, they uh, activate uh, low pressure about uh, eight uh, times 10 uh, minus 11 torr of pressure to, to, how can I say, to provide that the, the decay or the transition of this metastable level to the ground state is only because it's spontaneous uh, emission. And yeah. Okay, so understanding how the experiments uh, detected quantum jumps, it's important to understand the level structure and how lasers works on here. So, we have five levels, and you can separate in two three level systems employing the ground state. The first one is used to code the atom. So, I have the ground state, this state, this excited state here, and the shelved state, but the shelved no, the met stable states here. And we have two lasers. Oops. We have two lasers here. The first one 
connecting these two states in the first the second one connect these two. The first one uses is the main to cool the atom, the ion, and the second uses just because the ion can stay here in the case here and you need to pump back to the ground state. It's the f our first three level system, just for understand. And our second is this ground state, the higher state, and the our shelved state. So here you have a lump. Um, the experiments use a filter to select this only this one wave, uh, wavelength. And you can excite it from the ground state, the higher state, and the case to our shelved state. Okay? So the quantum jump is going to be the transition between the shelved state and the ground state. To understand the, uh, here, we have just at the at start of our experiment, we have just the lump off and just lasers working, cooling the ion. And when, it, when the, uh, and the ion um, falls from this state to the ground state, we have a mission photo that you can detect in, in the experiment. So after that, the lump, after some time, the lump is on, and you can see now this transition occur. Here, uh, down here, but when it evolutes and it permits the state evolute, you can see this, this transitions here. And the quantum jumps, we can detect when we have these abrupt transitions between these states, that the ground state and the shelved state. So here is how we detect, the how the experiments detect the quantum uh, quantum jumps, okay? So this abrupt transition is a signal for us uh, of the ground, uh, the quantum jumps occurring, okay? Um, so uh, for explaining, no, wait. <laughs> no, how do I explain the demo? <laughs> I don't know how to use the <laughs> Ah, okay, okay. For explain uh, this model, we just need um, the physics of Planck, Einstein, and Bohr that we well know uh, for electrodynamics. Um, we can explain uh, this experiment using an uh, atom of two levels and in an spectral density of radiation U. So um, the Einstein coefficients uh, for the three processes that can occur when the atom interacts with the light are denoted by BU for the absorption, the same for the stimulated emission, and for sp uh, spontaneous emission, we have A. Um, what we want uh, to do is to calculate, calculate uh, the time that the atom remains on each of its states, uh, which can be done um, by obtaining uh, the exponential decay for each of the states. So um, in the limit of, of a weak field, um, for for uh, for the excited state, the only process that contributes to the decay is the spontaneous emission. So the decayment is written in this form. And um, if we average on time, we obtain that the dual time, which is the time uh, the atom remains in in a state, is given by the inverse of the Einstein coefficient. Uh, we have um, a similar result for the ground state, and well. What we want to no do now is to apply this to our uh, three-level atom, and we can use a two-level atom to describe these tra transitions because after applying the lamp, which suppress um, this wave, uh, this wavelength, the only transition that occurs is the one of the ground state to the second excited state. So we can use um, the same. Um, Einstein coefficient for this transition, and but we need to introduce uh, another uh, rate that considers uh, the rapid decay from this state uh, to this one. So it's a very simple model, and at the end we just have this expression for the decayment of the ground state, and this um, model uh, is compared with experimental results, and we f they found that uh, it fits well, and that's all.
So I was curious, why do you need a very different uh, lifetimes for your two transition? Why won't it work if you have a similar lifetimes? I can try if you, you can correct me, but you need two different times because once uh, atoms uh, decays in that shelf, in shelf level, uh, they are not, uh, how can I say that, they are not uh, able to, to emit photons in the fluorescence, uh, in the fluorescence process. So where uh, we are here, when the atom is in this part that is red, uh, the, 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 the metastable uh, level, uh, they can't uh, return to the, the fluorescence cycle. So during this time, it's easy to, to measure, to observe that the atom, because this dark uh, period, the atom are in that metastable level. So it's a, how can I say, it's a way to, to maintain or to, to, to put the, the star, the, the atom in this level, and then uh, they can't uh, emit these fluorescence photons. I don't know if it is the question. So. Okay, thank you for your attention. We are going to present a brief report, science report, called Bosch-Einstein Condensations of Potassium Atoms by Synthetic Cooling. Um, this is good. So the mot this paper is motivated by, is motivated, was motivated by three, po three, this three points, difficulties in cooling potassium to to, uh, is due to its narrow hyperfine structure. Okay. Uh, at that time, it was better known techniques for cooling rubidium. Okay. So, sympathetic cooling was already being <coughs> performed, but not for two different species. In this paper, the, the author presents uh, sympathetic cooling of potassium uh, using laser cooling of rubidium, so. So now a brief explanation about our experimental setup. So first we have uh, sodium and potassium uh, being heated in an oven until they become a vapor. So, uh, so they are in an oven and then become a vapor and go to a MOT1 where they're trapped and with a push beam they are sent to a MOT2 where all the things are gonna happen. So in this MOT2, we have some traps, uh, a quadrupole coil that will trap the atoms and IOFI coil that will stabilize the uh, magnetic gradient. So uh, at this point, the temperature of both rubidium and potassium are, are thermalized at 300 microkelvin, so they are not a BC. Uh, so we we do a uh, evaporative cooling for rubidium so that his temperature decreases and then when he thermalizes both rubidium and potassium are bc that's the sympathetic cooling so now we're going to discuss the general results they actually got in uh, showing their graphics and illustration that they had so the first idea, like uh, Pedro said, they chose the rubidium because it was easier at the time to cool them. The potassium is still a bit messy until today because you have to use gray molasses and stuff. But they chose the rubidium, so the potassium, uh, they put it like uh, 300 microkelvins, but they chose to evaporate cool the rubidium. 
and like a previous group said and explain how the evaporate cooling of rubidium works, what it happens is that you're going to, if you look here at the number of atoms, you're going to lose it already because you start a higher number here, 10 to 8, and while potassium starts close to 10 to 6. And, but you as you start to cooling down the rubidium, what they observe is that the temperature of both of them actually follow as close. So by cooling rubidium, you actually can do the sympathetic cooling of the potassium. And that's great because uh, you can get then the BC of the rubidium, but it does help as well the potassium get to the BC. So in this graphic of their density, what you can see is that uh, as long as rubidium is already going to the BC at the cooling down, so you don't see the change of density because they're already going to the coherent, sta the coherent state. Uh, potassium, on the other hand, it's already on like, uh, it's pretty hot, but then it starts to get cooled down, and then you see the formation of the BC as the density of it changes and starts to be uniform, meaning that you're having the one wave uh, compartment. So, as you do it, again, they, they did the, three, the, the 3D uh, analysis of only the potassium, and you can see that the first you have the characteristic, uh, the gas, uh, uh, the gas of potassium is pretty hot. You see that you don't actually have the BC, but as soon as you start uh, cooling the uh, rubidium, you start to see the Gaussian shape of the potassium as well forming. And then here you still have some thermal bath and then you go to the, the BC of potassium. So if you do the 2D of that graphic, you're going to again uh, can be able to analyze it. And what they do is at the time they already had like a uh, uh, analytical exp expression for the Doppler the, the critical temperature of the potassium, uh, they check it, it did, uh, it was close to the same, so here the uh, 160 nanokelvins. So they did indeed, uh, were able to see that by sympathetic cooling the potassium, they did got the BC uh, of it. So the general conclusion of it, uh, they did a lot of things, but with it, it was so, they were able to cool the rubidium, but they still were able to analyze both species. So that, that's the thing, you're uh, cooling to a mixture, but maybe you only want to uh, analyze one, but you still would have two. But with it, they were able to still check the properties they wanted with the potassium, but in general, they did analyze uh, property of both of them, especially the scatter length of both uh, species, which they did analyze uh, for, while they were thermalizing. And with it, it was good at the time because you were still, until then, they still did not uh, have a BC of, potas of potassium itself. And like this, he said, you only had for mixtures of like same, uh, same species or different isotopes of that species. So it was already a great jump. And today we have the, the potassium, but for the time it was already good, uh, so good so something good. So thank you all for your attention. It's good because Gabriel is not here. I think he would have a lot of questions, but we got away with that. So good morning. Um, well, we will be presenting in this article laser cooling of a nanomechanical oscillator into its quantum ground state. 
and uh, so our talk will begin um, discussing this field of cavity optomechanics, which is all about coupling light, radiation pressure of light to an oscillator, mechanical oscillator. Uh, we'll talk about how to cool and amplify the motion of an oscillator, and we'll discuss the device and the results they got in this paper. So the article, this article is from a group in Caltech, the group of Oscar Painter, but now this field, uh, since 2011, this field is really um, developing pretty fast, so there are some groups in Brazil, for example, Campinas, that study this. Um, so what, what this field is about? It's all about coupling light to, to the mechanics. So you have, uh, in a model system here, you have uh, a fabric perot cavity. Here you have light. You have a laser. And uh, the radiation pressure of the laser uh, couples to the oscillator. It changes the position of the mirror. And changing the position of the mirror of a cavity modifies its resonance frequency. So there is uh, an interaction in which light modifies the position of the mechanics, and the mechanics modify the resonance frequency of an optical cavity. So you need uh, the optical cavity because the radiation pressure force is really small. Like if we look at the sun, uh, at the sun we will, we will of course feel the heat of the sun because of infrared absorption, but the radiation pressure force would be only uh, on the order of the weight of a few grains of sand. So really small. But you, if you have a very small uh, light mirror and you put it uh, into a resonant cavity with a high quality factor, then you can get coupling. So here are some model systems. You can have a uh, fabric perot cavity. You can have a whispering gallery mode. Uh, this is a, a light circulates here and the uh, radiation pressure forces outwards. S and you have the breathing modes. You can have membranes inside fabric perot cavities. You can have uh, photonic, uh, this one, photonic crystal cavity, which will be the system that we'll be studying here. Um, you can have atoms or dielectric particles inside cavities, or you can have your microwave radiation uh, trapped inside uh, uh, capacitors, and this will form an LC cavity uh, in the microwave domain, which is useful for uh, quantum computing using superconducting qubits. Um, so one way to understand the interaction in a simple picture, um, this is analogous to Raman scattering, if, uh, if, if you're from optics. But the idea is really simple. So you have, you have a mechanical mode here, so this, this will be your, your resonance of the mechanics. This will be the resonance of light. Um, this is the laser that you are pumping into your, your cavity. And if you pump your laser blue detune from the cavity resonance, you need to get rid of some extra energy to scatter a photon into the cavity. So uh, where this energy goes, it goes to the mechanical mode. So, so you are actually depositing phonons into your mechanical mode to scatter photons in your cavity. So this is amplification. Uh, and as we'll see this week in Marcelo's lecture, this is al also, in the Hamiltonian picture, a two-mode squeezer, because you create joint excitations in the mechanics and in the cavity. You create a phonon and a photon uh, in this interaction. And you can, have, you can pump uh, in the other side, so you pump, uh, you pump red detuned, then you need some extra energy to scatter a photon uh, into the cavity, and you get this energy from your mechanical mode. So this leads to cooling, to ground state. Thank you. How do I? Oh, there. Well, the, opti the optomechanical device consists in a cavity. How, how do you? Oh, OK, thanks. The optomechanical device consists of a narrow nano beam that's called cavity inside a photon band gap shield, OK? The central cavity has a perturbation in its periodicity, and the photonic band gap shield is a uh, cross pattern. Here, there are some simulations of the electrical field inside the cavity and the displacement of the breathing mode that's exaggerated to know how it, it would behave. There's also a displacement simulation that's logarithmic in the interface right between the photonic band gap and the central cavity. 
Well, the experimental setup, it was a bit complicated, but it can be broken down in just a red detuned laser, a cavity that's in a, in a cryostat that's being pumped with a fiber taper, and an optical reading from, from the cavity. Here is the reflection spectrum of the optomechanical device with the characteristics deep in reflection from resonance at 3.68 gigahertz. And the most important result is that the average phonon occupancy is lower than one, indicating that the device has reached its quantum ground state. So the, the actual occupancy was 0 0.85 phonons and you can't really see it here, but it says average phonon, it says uh, average phonon number versus cooling drive laser power. So the laser power, it's uh, the, the unit of the x-axis doesn't really matter. What's most important is the, unix, the unit of the y-axis that indicates that's lower than one phonon. So as for the conclusions, do you want to do the conclusions or do I? So just to, to conclude, w it's the first demonstration together with another experiment actually in the same year in the microwave domain, but it's the first demonstration in the optical domain of cooling a mechanical oscillator to its quantum ground state. And then after this work, uh, many works followed and now we, can ha we have squeezing, we have a uh, single phonon manipulation and all sorts of amazing experiments in this field of optomechanics. Um, so it's the basis for single phonon redial and manipulation, entanglement between light and mechanical oscillators, memories um, uh, in solid state memories, which may be used for quantum information processing. And one important application is the transduction. It, uh, these mechanics can, can have resonances compatible with the microwave domain. So you have transductors, which transduce signals in the microwave to optical domain. This is very interesting because one of the most promising candidates for quantum computing is superconducting qubits. So like in the, in the Google uh, Sycamore processor. So you could couple the signals of a computation in a supercomputer super to fiber optics. And uh, another really interesting uh, um, experiments are using uh, these kinds of oscillators because they have a significant mass they can couple to gravity. And uh, one, one field that is starting to develop is trying to study gravity quantum effects uh, using these systems. For example, doing entanglement, not with the electromagnetic interaction, but with the gravi gravitational interaction. It's still many orders of magnitude uh, for us to be able to do something, uh, s this experiment, but people are pushing into this direction. So. So usually uh, when you get your signal from, from the transductor, it has a, a lot of loss, right, in, ma in intensity, right? Do you know okay, uh, what I've saw is something like 20 times or 100 times smaller in intensity. Have you ever seen something in this uh, regard? I, I'm not really sure, like, um, you mean that the loss, like, you, you have a loss of uh, t 20 dBs. Uh, I, I actually, we can discuss it later, but I actually think that they have efficiency, like fidelity of transferring with these devices of 70%, so much greater. So you can have, because of, you, you actually have, um, you have entanglement, actually, of your light field with your mechanics. And nowadays, I, I think the, the figures of merits are pretty, uh, pretty high for this, this kind of devices. But there are recent papers, I think from 2020, where they've shown this. We can discuss it later.
so pointer and left. Hello, everyone. So we are going to present this paper from a physical, a physical review letter. That uh, the main idea of this uh, uh, this letter is that they produced an um, unrenced and inhibited visible emission um, by atoms in a cofocal resonator. So uh, the idea is that. When you have like, when you have um, a, um, a resonator, you can change the um, emission of the spontaneous. Uh, you can change the rate of the spontaneous emission. So, when you have a cofocal resonator, you have uh, like uh, de degenerated modes that can be excited, and then this uh, poss possibility um, can be can make it possible that you have um <laughs> that you can have like um a total emission rate difference so the what i want to do here is that the total emission but i but i have to okay so uh, the idea is that the total emission rates can be written like this and we can have like um um the upper bound like an enhancement uh, by this um ex uh, expression and then and they inhibit by this expression this expression is um uh, it, it they have like this they are dependent on the um, uh, solid angle of the confocal resonator and they are um um they are <laughs> sorry uh they are uh this uh this r that is a product about the radius of the m the mirrors the the mirrors in the that makes the cavity so the total emission rate um can be changed and this article uh it's interesting because they they did this experimentally with uh, Ethereum, right? That's why we say Ethereum, and it it is on a visible s uh, spectra. So okay. So let's talk about the experimental. Where is that? experimental arrangement. We have a uh, ethereum atom is lot to 174. And here, the, this figure, we have a zoom where the sample of atoms are localized. So uh, they are uh, excited by a laser here, transversal laser, and M2 M2 and M1 are mirrors that work like a um, resonator cavity. And the mirrors have uh, a little aperture here where the light is transmitted. And here you have a lens, here you have a filter, a photomultiplier, and here you have a transducer uh, where the signal is um, detected and the photons are counted. And so the um, basically that's it. That's all. So to the experimental results. Um, in A to C, you see <coughs> results for the cavity with an aperture of one millimeter, so with a small aperture, just not the full cavity mirror. <laughs> And uh, C is just the background counting rate, which then is uh, subtracted 
from the other rates. In B, we have a closed cavity so that we can have basically the free spontaneous emission rate. And in A, we see the uh, full spontaneous emission rate we should get. And we then can compare A and B very easily to, uh, to find how it uh, does through the theoretical prediction layers are presented. Um, where basically we should always get this 1 over 1 minus r value, where I think she accidentally misspoke r as the geometric mean of the reflectivity of the mirrors. Um, unfortunately, there's this video over my slide, so you'll just have to believe me that the ratio for the inhibitance of, this <laughs> of the spontaneous emission rate is 42, which works very well with the theoretical prediction of 43.5 plus minus 2 from the experimental setup. On the other hand, for the uh, so this you can just from the get from the graph by seeing this lower minimum here, comparing it to the line B, uh, which is then a factor of 42. For the enhancement, you'll get just an effect of 19 from these maxima. And uh, this is due to broadening of the resonance peak to, on one hand, Doppler shift effects, and on the other hand, some aberration of uh, the setup. So if we then go to the full aperture in F and E, you will find that uh, still the ratio for the inhibitance is very well predicted by theory, but since we now take the full cavity mirrors into account, there are additional aberrations in the cavity mirror and uh, the ratio gets even worse. However, in uh, D, we find the uh, airy function which Laris are presented as fitted to A, not really fitted, but uh, just taking, just taking the, uh, just taking the broadening effects into account, and so the theoretical prediction can show this very well. And so, uh, the group have um, two my uh, results. The first one is the visible spectrum. Um, this emission, this uh, spontaneous emission, occurs in a visible spectrum, so it is more easy to detect the photon. And the second, my my result is that the resonator acts in such a way that we have an increase of 19 times the spontaneous emission, or we can also decrease the spontaneous emission by 42, 42 times. So uh, the resonator really works to increase or to decrease the spontaneous emission. And uh, I think uh, that's it. Thank you. Hi guys. Good morning. Uh, and my group uh, got to the a uh, paper lazy colleague of uh, anti hydrogen atoms. Uh, my name is Levi, he is Levi too. <laughs> uh, Angelo, uh, uh, my speaking English, uh, I don't speak English 
Very well. Então... E... É, this paper discusses new uh, developments uh, in lazy colony of uh, hydrogen atoms. The study of uh, antimatter is important because it uh, can provide valuable inform information about, about the nature of the universe. The paper lays colony of the hydrogen atoms uh, uh, was published in the journal Naturist on March 21, uh, 2021, and described an innovation and advanced techniques for studying and manipulation antimatter atoms. Colleague antimatter with uh, lazy is a uh, challenging technique, but it uh, is necessary to observe and analyze the properties of these atoms. This development called lead uh, to new discovery. As well uh, as in particular physics, cosmology, and atomic and molecular physics, additionally, studying antimatter can provide and so and so is to write there is no primordial antimatter in the universe. Uh, thank you. So, giving you an uh, introduction, why to study hydro uh, anti-hydrogen? So, first is antimatter, it's and everyone is uh, wants to know, know more about antimatter. So, the anti-hydrogen is the atom with the simplest example of anti uh, atomic antimatter. So, we studies with anti-hydrogen allow tests of fundamental, fundamental symmetries. You can we can compare the anti uh, the anti hydrogen with the hydrogen, so we can uh, test symmetries about charge, priority, in time invariance, and Einstein's equivalence principle. Uh, to to do this work, the the authors dev develop uh, to pr uh, techniques were de developed to produce, confine, and integrate code antimatter. The kinetic energy of the and the hydrogen uh, impose limitations on the precision of the experiments. So they have to prepare the atoms to the lowest kinetic energy possible. So to do that, they, they did a Doppler cooling. So here I'm, I'm going to talk to you to those who don't know what's a Doppler cooling. So here we, ha we have the atom. The stationary atom see a laser, neither head or blue shift. So it doesn't absorb the photo. If the atom is moving along the laser, it it sees it sees its redshift, so it doesn't absorb the photo. But the atom is moving towards the laser beams, it it sees its blue shift and absorbed photon slowing the atom. The atom is excited and emits a photon uh, isometrically, so the net change in momentum it's zero. In this case of this uh, paper, they, opa, they they use a exciting uh, exciting photon right slightly below the the exciting frequency, so it's red shifted. So when the the atom is moving towards the photon, it can absorb the photon, excite, and then slow down. In this case of the hydrogen, by exciting the 1s to 2p Lyman transition, a net velocity of change of 3.3 meters per second can be exerted for each photon at this wavelength. So this is a more precise figure. So this is the laser pulse, and the, this is the atom. The atom sees the laser pulse blue shifted, absorb the 
the photon, then the decay is slowing down the, f the, the atom. When he's moving along with the laser beam, there's no absorption. Well, now I'll talk a little bit about the experimental setup. Uh, I will try to be quick so we can go eat early. Uh, well, this is the experimental, the main experimental setup of the alpha collaboration. They have a superposition of two different traps, a uh, magnetic trap for neutral atoms, in this, in this case the anti-atoms, and a, a penning trap, a penning Malberg trap, a uh, cylindrical penning trap for the charged particles. They produce the anti-atoms by mixing both the antiprotons and the positrons in the same penning trap. And as Gabriel and Friedrich Hevi told us, these three body collisions between two positrons and one antiproton produce the neutral hydrogen, anti-hydrogen atoms. Uh, okay? Uh, the anti-hydrogen atoms that are produced in these two hyperfine states that are the, the low field seekers states are trapped inside this magnetic trap here, this magnetic field, if they have energies below uh, about 50 micro electron volts. This is uh, an energy equivalent to, to five, 500 millikelvin. And well, to perform the laser cooling of the antimatter, of the antiatoms, they had a lot of problems. For example, this wavelength, it's a uh, vacuum neutral violet, so they had to produce the, the laser beams inside the apparatus, inside the, the vacuum chamber. They need to put a lot of, a lot of magnesi flu magnesium fluoride mirrors, oh, I'm sorry, windows, and since the lack of optical access, they had to cool the atoms along only one direction. Uh, all here that work with laser cooling, uh, almost every time make the cooling in the three directions, and since there is no optical access, access to the trap in these directions, uh, in the transverse directions, they had to cool only one direction. By, but by changing the magnetic field shape, they could couple the other two transverse directions with the longitudinal direction to cool the atoms in three dimensions. Well, I will not talk about, about the other problems because I don't have much time. And those are the main results. They saw uh, the, the optical transition, the line shape getting narrower, narrower and this time of flight measurement that measures the time the atoms that leaves the trap and collides with the internal walls of the trap and are annihilate, uh, tells us, shows us that there is a uh, delay as they cool the sample. For example, here, when they have no cool, uh, they have this time of flight measurement Almost all the, the atoms are annihilate in short times, but when they cool the, the sample, the, there is the delay in the, in the time of flight measurement. And those are the most important results of this paper. Uh, I will be re re really quick here. They saw this, this absorption spectrum getting four times narrower uh, after cooling this sample. So uh, if you want to, to know a little bit more, you may ask some questions. I already got all the 10 minutes, so uh, thank you. Oh, I'm curious. What is there a difference in cooling an atom or an anti-atom, fundamentally? Fundamentally, no. It's okay. all the same. Uh, they perform other measurements comparing. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's the same. They, com they performed another measurements comparing hydrogen with anti-hydrogen. And they saw that at least in 
12 significant digits, they have the same result for hydrogen and anti-hydrogen. Uh, they are trying to perform the same measurement with hydrogen uh, in the same magnetic trap, and they believe that it will achieve like uh, 15, 16 significant digits to, to find some difference between hydrogen and anti-hydrogen. And maybe in this, this, uh, this digit, in the 70th digit, they, they will find something. Okay, a bit disappointing. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, it will be probably disappointing. <laughs> at uh, 5 past 11 here, okay? I think the coffee break is still upstairs. Thank <laughs> you. 